Thank you, Brahman. I'm trying to share my screen. <laughs> oh, there it goes. Uh, how do I get that? All right, there we go. Can you all see that? Yes, we can. Can everybody hear me? I had to buy a new camera because my online camera was flaking out on me, so I had to buy a new one. So it seems to be working a little better. So anyway, good evening, everyone. Thank you. I'm a um, recent um, addition to the Herb Club. I joined in about 2019, uh, two years ago, three years ago. And anyway, this presentation I'm doing for you is called King Snakes of the United States, Fax Care, Breeding, and Husbandry. And uh, that first picture there, I'm also a photographer, so that first picture there is of my of my male uh, Florida king. He's a they're now called Eastern Kings with uh, the Florida variant. So uh, that's a picture of my big male snake. So I will move hey, along. Russ, you don't have it in a presenter. I mean, in the presentation mode. So if you want to. All start right. How do I do that? Presenter. Uh, go to slideshow, right? Go to slideshow at the top. Uh, to your, no, to the right over okay, here. Okay, I got yeah. you. From the beginning, right? To the left, to the left, right there. Okay, sorry. Is there that you, better? That's, yep, perfect. Okay. All right. So uh, I think I already talked to this. So y'all could see that before you just, it was just not full screen? Yes. Okay. All right. So who am I? I want you to know who I am and why I'm doing this. Um, I was born and raised in Texas. I fell in love with snakes as a, as a young boy. I, I was so young, I don't even remember when it was. Um, and I was never really scared of them. I just always was one of those snakes and snails and puppy dog tails kind of kid, I guess. So um, it goes way, way back for me. And I'm also, I'm also a photographer, like I mentioned. I'm interested in the arts and photography. So I've had some formal photography training. Um, but I'm not a biologist. A lot of herpetologists, professionals in the industry are either um, biologists or herpetologists. Uh, but I'm not, although I do have a master's degree in business. I'm, I'm pretty well educated and I got my master's fairly fairly recently and it was all about PowerPoints and doing presentations and doing group work. So uh, I guess I have a little bit of experience with doing that. Um, as the shirt uh, shows in this photo, I'm, I'm kind of strange. I may suddenly start talking about snakes. I'm a snake guy, although I do love all herbs. Um, I worked in the security business for many years. I was a technician, and then I went into management and uh, business later on in my career. Um, I've moved to Maryland. I've only been in Maryland about four or five years. I lived in Washington, D.C. and uh, New York City before that. So there wasn't a lot of herps in New York City or <laughs> Washington, D.C., So, but I, but I recently kind of got back into it. I have about 12 snakes and three cats that I'm currently taking care of, and I, I, I'm a lifelong learner. I just love to read. I love to learn, and that's one of the things I love about herpetology is because there's so much to learn. You can never know it all, and uh, when I was a little kid, I used to get my assignments at school done, and I'd go to the library, and I'd check out any book I could find on reptiles and amphibians. And I just read it. I just, I just loved it. And some of the pictures I saw when I was a little boy were of king snakes and corn snakes and milk snakes and the really pretty snakes of the United States. And I just fell in love with them. I always wanted to have some. So um, um, recently, I started keeping snakes myself, and I, and those are the species I went to. Those are the ones I gravitated to because I always thought they were so. So handsome, so just so gorgeous. Uh, I'm also a dedicated advocate for herb conservation, and um, 
you know, it's, it's, if you haven't figured it out, I'm a snake guy. <laughs> so what I did for this, um, the presentation is called King Snakes of the United States. So I split them up into the, the Eastern and the West. Um, and um, all of this data is coming from the current Peterson's field guide. It's dated 2016. I can't find a newer field guide right now. Uh, maybe they're coming out, I don't know yet, but a lot of the scientific names of these snakes changed fairly recently because the, the scientists and the tech, taxonomists uh, have better information because of DNA testing and genetic testing and some of that stuff. So all of these scientific names are from the, the current field guide. And there's a lot of older people in the herp in the herp world that are kind of mad about it because all these names changed. Some of these names changed. So I, I'm just using what's current. I, I don't um, have as strong of feelings. I heard I was down in Texas this year herping, and I heard some guys just arguing over this stuff. And I I don't really have a strong opinion one way or the other. This is just what these current scientific names are, and and one thing I will say is, you know, like I went to Texas and all the hurt people out there, they only use scientific names. If you use a common name, like just call it an Eastern King Snake, they look at you like you're kind of, you know, out of step or something. And I also know that in Europe, other parts of the world, um, they don't use common names when they're referring to a particular reptile or amphibian. They only use the scientific names. So. I do kind of think it's important to learn the scientific names, even though it gets it kind of gets overwhelming. But these are the ones. This, this, there's two lists here. There's an east and a west, and these lists are not intended to be um, the entire country. I might have missed one or two species here and there because, like I said, a lot of the species changed and the subspecies changed. Um, but for this part of the United States, we have the Eastern King Snake, Speckled King Snake, Black King Snake, Mole King Snake, Prairie King Snake, Eastern Milk Snake, and Scarlet King Snake. And I'm not going to read all the scientific names, but those are the currently accepted ones, like I said, from the current guide. And here's the pictures. Uh, the one on the upper left is an Eastern King Snake, like they look like here. In Maryland, if you can find one, they're, they're, they're really hard to find here in Maryland um, for reasons I'm not 100% sure of. Um, there's a speckled king snake in the upper right. These are more from the southern parts of the United States, south central Louisiana, parts of Texas, Mississippi, etc. And then there's the black king snake. I've, I've actually never seen one of those or a mole king snake yet. Uh, but the mole king snakes are underground a lot. They, um, they're, they're, they're not commonly seen. Um, and there's three more species here. The prairie king snake, the eastern milk snake, and the scarlet king snake. And I do want to say I have caught some rat snakes and a snake out in Texas called the glossy snake. And they look almost identical to this prairie king snake. That pattern on that snake is very common. So it's really hard to tell the difference between them when you're out in the field. Um, but there is a separate species called the prairie king snake that looks like two of these other two of these other states snakes. Um, Eastern milk snakes are not uncommon to the state of Maryland. We have a few here. Uh, they're not always easy to find, but we do there we do have quite a few of them here in, in Maryland. Uh, but the other thing about these snakes, is I'm going to go back and forth and talk about it a little later, why people like them for pets is because you can see all the variety. You can see all the different colors, and they're all just they're just really beautiful snakes. All of them are really, really attractive for people who want to keep them. So for the Western United States, it actually even gets a little more colorful. I've got a California king snake, California mountain king snake, Sonora mountain king snake, desert king snakes, Western milk snakes, and gray banded king snakes. 
and they get really colorful out west in the deserts and particularly in the southwest as you can see they are just stunning and this is one of the reasons why a lot of people like to keep them they're, they're commonly kept and bred as pets and uh, you can see why they're they're very attractive snakes all of them once again we got the california king mountain king sonora mountain king not all of these are my photos some of these are my photos the one on the lower left is my photo i actually had that's my little female that i brought back from texas um and then the western milk snakes are interesting because there are so many different color varieties they look a lot like coral snakes they're called coral snake mimics and you can see we have a venomous snake in, in the United States called a coral snake, and it, these snakes look a lot like them. But it's the red touch yellow, kill a fellow, red touch black, poison black. And this is, as you can see in the photo, it's, it's uh, red touch black. Not a venomous snake, but still a really stunning, beautiful snake. Okay, king snake fun facts. Um, there's at least one species of king snakes native to most states within the continental United States, except for the really far north states uh, where it gets really cold. So even up here in Maryland and even further north, there you can find milk snakes. Um, a lot of the other king snake uh, species are they're, they're warmer. They're warmer. They're, you find more of them down in the deserts. And in the swamps and the you know in the wet part of the southeast, the warmer parts of the country. But we still do have a lot of them up here in the north. Uh, king snakes are non-venomous; they're harmless to humans. Um, and the genus name, which is the first part of their scientific name, means shiny shield in Greek. I believe yes, in Greek. This is because they're glossy, shiny scales. They're really shiny animals and colorful animals. And king snakes are named kings because they can and do eat other snakes, including the venomous ones, and they're immune to snake venom. So they're called kings a lot like there's a king cobra in the Far East are called king cobras because they basically do the same. They eat a lot of other snakes. Um, the king snakes here in the United States are only, only immune to the snake venom from like rattlesnakes and copperheads. So it's just the ones that are around them that they're immune to, not, not necessarily ones from overseas. Um, many king snakes, they're not, they're not incredibly big snakes. They're relatively short and stocky, but they're very, very muscular and very strong. They're constrictors. That's how they kill their prey. And they are powerful apex predators. And, and pound for pound, they're one of the strongest constrictor snakes. Pound for pound, they're stronger than even a lot of boas and a lot of pythons. They're not uh, necessarily big snakes, but um, as I'll show you in a minute, in a minute, a lot of other snakes are scared of them for good reason. And king snakes is one of the good reasons they make really good pets. Is they'll eat pretty much anything. They'll eat birds, eggs, reptiles, amphibians, rodents. Um, you name it, they're, they're opportunistic feeders. They'll eat pretty, pretty much anything you can give them. Um, and it's one of the reasons they do really well in the wild. In the wild, a lot of king snakes, the ones that I found, especially in the south, like in Texas and in the deserts, they actually prefer to eat other reptiles like snakes and lizards. But they'll pretty much eat anything. Uh, this one here, this is just courtesy of our club president. This is one of his big males. This is an Eastern King snake, a uh, Florida variety, Florida variant. It's called a white sides male. And it is just, just a gorgeous snake. I'm, I'm really happy with this photo I took of it. And you can see just, just a really, really handsome snake. And it's um a big male that helps him you know they lay eggs every year so i'll show you the female in a minute but uh really really attractive you, you're not normally going to find something like this out in the wild but breeders have genetically um bred snakes to, to to have these types of these types of colorations in in uh in captivity 
Okay, more king snake facts. <laughs> king snakes are strictly nocturnal. That means they hunt at night, they're out at night, and they pretty much hide during the day. Um, they're terrestrial, which means you're not going to find them. They can climb trees, but you're not typically going to find them off the ground. You're going to find them on the ground. Um, wild, wild king snakes in many habitats are frequently found near the water. But like I said, there's some really cool ones that live out in the desert and they thrive in a variety of habitats. They do well. Um, they do well pretty much wherever they are. Um, like other U.S. species, many subspecies have been recently eliminated due to advances in DNA and genetic testing. Um, so like a couple of the photos I've showed you, what you those snakes we used to be called Florida king snakes, and that was a separate subspecies. They're now just called eastern king snakes with that Florida look to them, the, the Florida colors. They're, they're, they tend to be brighter and yellower down there. Um, but on the other hand, many of those former subspecies that, that used to be considered subspecies are now um, now have their own now have their own species status because the genetics showed that the snakes the snakes were a full species instead of a subspecies. Some some snakes went from a subspecies to just being a color variant and other species, subspecies went being full species recently. So the scientists, the scientific names are changing because they now know that their, uh, their genetic uh, lineage has changed. Um, the other thing, it took me a while to figure this out, but king snake musk, pretty much every snake for a defensive measure will put out this gooey stuff when they're stressed out, that'll that'll that stinks basically. We call it musk in the herd community. And king snake musk will upset other snakes. <laughs> I have a couple of corn snakes, and every so often I pick up one of my corn snakes and it would get just really upset, really stressed out, and I couldn't really handle it because it and I finally figured out it was because I had handled one of my king snakes and didn't wash my hands. So it kind of took me a while to kind of figure that out. It does make sense, but because snakes native to the United States, like these king snake species, even though they may have never seen one in the wild or never, they, they somehow know that smell and, it, and they know it's dangerous to them. So they get stressed out. And I didn't find this out until the last trip I took to Texas last year, but some king snakes and certain other snakes, when they musk, It'll have blood in it. It'll actually have blood in it. And uh, I thought I found a couple of snakes that in the desert last year on the roads, and I thought I actually might have hit them with my car accidentally because I picked up the snake and there was some blood. And I was I realized later that it was not it wasn't that the snake wasn't injured, but they will musk blood sometimes. I, I'm not sure why they do that, but it does happen. This is another one of Tom's snake. This is a big female. This is an adult species. It's called the Eastern King snake with the Florida coloration. And they're just, it looks a lot different than his male, but it, they're just really, this is one of the snakes when I got back into herpetology, herping, I knew I wanted to keep one of these. So I got a couple of females that they're not quite this big yet, but I always knew I wanted one because I think there's just really cool snakes. Okay, so why would you choose a king snake as a pet? Um, and like you've seen, they're very, very col they're very, very colorful, depending on which, which um, species you pick or which ones you want to keep. Um, they eat really, really well in captivity. They do really, really well in captivity. They breed well. And they're they're really tame. That they don't tend to be, you know, irritable or aggressive, and they don't bite very often. So they're even really good for children. They're, they make they make very good pets. Most most of them make very good pets. Um, another good thing about king snakes as pets is they don't get too big. They don't. The records are five or six feet for most species, somewhere in there, and they don't get too large once. 
you know, you get a, a particular species of boa or python, they can get, you know, 10 or 12 feet on you, and it can get really expensive to feed them. So king snakes don't get real big, and they eat pretty much what you give them. So that's another reason they're very popular as pets. Um, and like I said, they're not picky eaters. So, you know, even if you have, um, you know, access to lizards or, or eggs or something like that, or birds or rodents, they'll pretty much eat anything. Okay, so this, this shot, <laughs> It took me a while to figure out what happened here, but um, this is a Western Diamondback rattlesnake out on a road in the in the deserts of Texas, in West Texas. And I couldn't. I, I took this shot. I didn't know why it did this. Most, this is very strange behavior for a rattlesnake. They'll usually coil up and get in a defensive posture and threaten to bite you, and they'll rattle their tail. Well, this one I came across one night, and it just got in this, what I call a fetal position. It got all coiled up, and it covered up its head with its coils like this. And I realized a lot later on that earlier in the night, I had picked up a desert king snake off the road that musked me, and oh, it also bit me <laughs> and it musked me, and... I washed my hands. I cleaned my hands after that, but, but I still had that scent on me from the king snake. And I realized that this diamondback rattlesnake smelled that. It picked it up the scent, and they're they're afraid of king snakes. So um, it goes into this little defensive posture when it smells a uh, uh, apex predator that may eat it. King snakes eat rattlesnakes all the time out the desert. So I thought I'd throw this in there to like. And then the my pet can eat your pets. <laughs> Some of the guys out in Texas go, yeah, well, I got rattlesnake pets, and you can't eat, you can't keep them in Maryland because it's not legal. And I say, yeah, but my king snake can eat your rattlesnake, and they do in the wild. They do. Okay, acquiring a king snake. Um, it's best to buy a young one for me, for me, than to take on an adult snake. Although. Um, for a variety of reasons, some people may want to take on a larger adult snake, but I think it's a good idea. And this is what I did. I bought hatchling king snakes from a dealer or a pet store. You can do it locally. You can buy them online. They're not incredibly expensive snakes to buy. Uh, make sure the seller tells you what the snake's been eating. You know, if you buy a little one and it's eating pinky mice, that's what you want to try to keep feeding it. Um, there are some advantages from buying from a local pet store or a reptile show. You can see the snake, you can handle it, you can make sure you like it, like the way it looks, make sure it looks healthy. Um, but also a lot of online dealers, they're very reputable. The, the, the better ones are not going to sell you a sick snake or um, one that's not well fed. So, you know, I've had good success online as well. So, but you do want to make sure before you buy one that it looks good, it looks healthy. And I got a couple of pictures later of my little baby, my baby king snakes that I bought. Um, and there are some species of hatchling king snakes and other snakes like rat snakes that look a little different as they age, their color changes as they age. Um, so, you know, you want to make sure sometimes, a couple of times I bought snakes online, I said, okay, can you send me a picture of the adults so I know what this snake's going to look like when it grows up, um, that kind of thing. Um, but bringing home wild snakes as pets, um, I, I wouldn't recommend that. I do do it from time to time, occasionally, um, but, but they're not the best pets. The ones that are captive bred do much better. Um, it's just kind of, um, I don't know, I don't know, it's, it's especially if you're new to keeping snakes or keeping her herps, uh, I would, I would always recommend getting one that's been bred captively. And I'm going to show you here, this slide, I actually had to get in the, the, the attic 
and dig these old pictures up. You can see me as a young photographer in seventh grade. And to be fair, some of the older folks might remember these. You know, I had like a Kodak disc camera. There were these horrible little cameras that were made out of plastic and, you know, the, the film wasn't that good or whatever. But um, I dug these, these old photos up from, and this is literally when I was in seventh grade. It was about 74, 1975. And you can see the pictures aren't in focus or anything, but we had two speckled king snakes when I lived in, uh, I lived in Louisiana for a year. And the one on the upper left is one I believe was bred in captivity and he was gray. And the one at the bottom, it's the same snake. He's more yellow colored. Um, and then I think my brother or one of my friends caught this other speckled king snake in Louisiana. It's more white colored. You can see it coiled up in this other picture. The wild snake, the one, the, the one on the right was a wild snake that we took in as a pet and it never calmed down. You can see that it's coiled up and it would strike the glass. It would hit, it would hit the cage and it never really calmed down. It was not, it wouldn't eat. And there was just a lot of problems. I do think we finally let it go. But it was so long ago, I don't actually remember. But the one that was captive bred, the one on the left, ate anything we gave it. It was great. We handled it. It didn't bite. It was just a better snake. It was just a better pet. Um, so that's one of my first lessons. Another thing in the bottom photo here, you can see the really horrible <laughs> cage lids we had in the 70s. <laughs> the snakes got out all the time because the cages weren't that good. The cages we got now, the enclosures we got now are much better, but you can see that the lid, that that uh, screen there, it's um it was not it was not good. It was not a very secure enclosure. That snake particular snake didn't get out. But anyway, I think it, it's it's one of the reasons why I, today I would rather keep a captive bred snake than a wild one. The wild ones are just they just don't it's, there's a lot more question marks. They may not settle down and they may not eat. Okay. Oh, excuse me. So what I'm using for my snakes right now, I'm using the commercially available glass or acrylic enclosures. They look like they look like fish tanks, but they're not really fish tanks. Uh, some of them have front doors, swinging doors on the front of the enclosure. Most of the ones I like have a solid sides and a fitted top. Um, I'm using an under tank electric heater that sticks to the bottom of the tank, on, only on one side of the floor of the enclosure. Uh, I'm using overhead incandescent lights, and I'll show y'all a picture here in a sec. Um, they burn out more and they use more electricity, but they generate heat and the LED lights just don't, don't do that. So I'm still kind of, working on what I want to do with that. I'm not real happy with um, what they call hot lights or heat lights or whatever, heat lamps. Um, but, you know, we'll see. I'm hoping something better will come out here soon. Uh, I usually have two water dishes in my enclosure. People ask me why, and it's mostly for humidity. I put one over the tank heater and one on the other side of the enclosure. And the one over the tank heater really evaporates. The water evaporates a lot quicker, um, but it creates humidity in the cage, which is important for snakes. It's important for most reptiles and amphibians for that matter. So I have temp temperature and humidity gauges in the enclosure. I have a humidity hide box that I have that I put moths in. So if the snake wants, the snake is too dry. The snake can crawl in there and get more moisture, just like with the heater. It can crawl around the cage to get to the temperature they like. So I want my snakes to be able to do what's comfortable for them and within their own cage. I have at least one other hide box in, 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 um, instead of the humidity hide box. I'm using Aspen. It's a wood chip, Aspen wood substrate for the bottom of the enclosure. Uh, there's a bunch of different stuff available commercially. There's coconut shells, and there's a lot of other stuff that works real well. But this is what I'm using. Um, and I have my lights and my heater on timers 
to pretty much try to replicate what's going on outside with sunshine and sunset, heat and cool at night. Um, so I was using a 12 on 12 off schedule for the timers for my heaters and my lights, but very recently I have these little discs you can see in this photo. Here's one of the cages, one of the enclosures. This has a sliding top. You can see the uh, temperature and humidity meters, uh, gauges. On the right is the, the box for the moss with the humidity. The hide box in the middle is, is a Pangea. It's called a P A N G E A. Um, I like them because they're black and no light gets through them. So the snakes really feel comfortable inside there. Snakes like to hide. So you got you to gotta give them a place to hide and where they feel comfortable. And then I just have, sometimes I have, I have some wood or something, you know, like a half log, and I'll usually put a stone or a rock in there as well to, to like maintain some heat. Um, give, them a, give them a branch to climb on. The corn snakes, the rat snakes like the branches a lot more. King snakes don't really use them. Actually, this is a, one of my corn snakes enclosures, so. Uh, but I'll still put it in there in case the snake wants to climb on something. But the, the little discs, uh, they're, they're compatible with, we have Alexa in my house, so I can say, Alexa, turn on this light, turn off that light. And we plug the lights into these little discs. I'm using those same discs to control my biting and my heaters for my snakes. Because now, Alexa, the applications have a feature that will turn on and off lights at sunrise or sunset. So it's actually perfect to turn on the lights at sunrise and turn them off at sunset because it basically mirrors what's going on outside and it keeps the snakes. Snakes like to be in tune with nature. So it's actually, it actually works out really, really well. Um, care parameters for king snakes during the day. And this can vary depending on what kind of snakes you're keeping. But I keep them between 75, 85 during the day. The heaters turn on, the lights turn on, it warms up. Then at night, they go off and the temperature drops about 10 degrees um, to the lower range there, you see. And I, I do try to keep the humidity 40 to 40 to 60%, somewhere in that range, because it's really important for snakes. They need humidity in order to shed their skin. If it's too dry, a lot of them, makes it harder for them to shed their skin. If it's too wet, then you can have problems with mold and, and other kinds of problems like disease, you know, mold and fungus and things like that. So this can vary depending on the snake, but this, this is a range that works really well for my king snakes. I, I do use filtered or bottled water, particularly for the smaller snakes. Um, Tap water, even though Maryland, this state, we're, we're pretty much known for the quality of our tap water. It's really, really good and it's really clean. But we put um, chemicals like chlorine and fluorine and some other chemicals in our water to keep it, um, I guess, sanitized. And those chemicals can actually harm or kill a snake. So, um, Chlorine's kind of okay because you can set a bottle, a glass of water out and leave it out in the open with the top open and the chlorine's going to dissipate, but some of those other chemicals won't. So it's just, for my snakes, I'll just give them something that doesn't have those chemicals in it. Um, I'm using frozen thawed rodents for my king snakes. Um, I don't give any live food to my animals. I just, for ethical reasons, I don't want to throw live animals in there with my snakes and have the snake kill it. I just buy um, food that's already frozen and then they eat really well. They eat, um, <laughs> they eat ravenously. <laughs> King snakes are really aggressive with the food. Um, but the reason I mix, I recently added rats because rats have more protein than mice and less fat. So when a snake is really young, I like to give them little pinky mice because it fattens them up and helps them grow. But once a snake is full grown, I like to switch them over to rats because it's kind of more calorie conscious. And uh, 
since captive snakes don't move around a lot, they don't burn a lot of calories. So kind of doing a kind of a balancing act there. I like clean cages, spacious cages. Well, snakes don't necessarily need that. They don't need a lot of room. Um, but I like to give my snakes that every snake has its own enclosure unless I'm trying to breed them. And uh, I, I keep everything clean and spacious just for me. I don't keep a ton of snakes, but I know guys that keep like hundreds of them and you, you can't necessarily do that with that many snakes. But I'm kind of not, I'm kind of not there yet. And this is my little, um, she's now two years old. She's, I think she's going to, I'm hoping she'll breed for me this year. She's a little red, high red. They called her a high red Florida king snake. And who says snakes aren't cute? <laughs> she's, this is when she was just a baby when I just first got her. But uh, I love this photo. She looks really, she's kind of faded. Her colors are not as red yet are not as red as they are in this photo but she's still a really she's still a really handsome snake uh feeding i'm using frozen thawed rat, mice and rats uh like i've said i guess that's kind of redundant um but do think feeding captive snakes live animals there's people that do it i think it presents a few problems and it can be dangerous for the snake so if you put live rats or mice in with the snake and you leave it the rats can actually kill the snakes too if you don't, if if the snake doesn't eat the doesn't kill and eat the animal. So it's just generally kind of uh, accepted that it's better to feed them pre killed pre killed prey. It's safer for the snakes. It's more humane for the my, mice and the rodents, and that's pretty much what most people do. Now, when I was a kid and we had those speckled king snakes, I showed you in a previous slide. We lived in Louisiana and there was anal lizards everywhere. They were all over the apartment complex and me and my brother would just go catch like 10 of them and just throw them in there with the, with the king snake and he'd eat them all, you know, but I don't, I don't do that. I don't do that anymore. Uh, we were just kids and we kind of didn't really know what we were doing. Um, but I do also, I do recommend smaller, more frequent meals for snakes than large, infrequent meals. Um, there are breeders and herpers who like to feed snakes really big meals and only feed them once every month or two. But I think it, I think it stresses the animal. They, the animals will do that in the wild. But that's because snakes in the wild don't know where their next meal is coming from. My snakes are going to have a meal whenever I give it to them. So I don't feel the need to, to bulk them up like that. Some, some people do. I just don't think it's good for them in the long run. Um, and, and like I said, any meal that creates a big bulge in the snake, they can eat things a lot bigger than they are. I just think it's too much for me. And, and I do, I do have to say, I've, I've got three or four snakes, that I've had since they were hatchlings and they grow, they, they've grown really, really well. So I don't really feel the need to overfeed an animal um, to make it grow and, you know, get it, get it to a certain size real quick. I'm, I'm not, I guess I'm not in any hurry and I don't think it's good for them. Um, and um, one of the things about feeding snakes and really any reptile or any amphibian, is there are times for many reasons where they won't eat. And temperature is one of the most critical variables for that. You gotta absolutely know what temperature that animal's at because they're ectomorphic or ectothermic, not ectomorphic, ectothermic. And that a snake and any reptile or amphibian, their, their body temperature and their metabolism is directly proportional to the temperatures of the outside environment. They're, they can't, control their temperature like we do, like the warm-blooded animals. So if they're not eating and they're too cold, yeah, they're not going to eat. They think it's winter. Um, and another reason king snakes are just really great pets is because they eat. They just eat. They'll eat whatever you give them. My other, I have corn snakes and rat snakes, and anything the corn snakes and rat snakes won't eat, king snakes will just snap it up. They'll. Um, 
they'll take whatever. And the, uh, some other snakes can be really finicky eaters. Um, but king snakes are cool to have, so I don't, I'm not throwing away, or, you know, throwing away food. Any, anything left over, I'll feed to the king snakes, and I'll work it into the, I'll work it into the system. And actually, the king snakes I had, they will actually grab the food. I'll present a food item into the cage on some tongs. And they will grab the food right off the tongs. Most of my other snakes won't even do that. Uh, the corn snakes will from time to time, but the king snakes just, they, they eat really, really well. This is a picture of a desert king snake from West Texas. Um, really cool snakes out there. This is this is one, and out there they eat a lot. They eat a lot of other snakes. They eat a lot of rattlesnakes out there in the desert. This is um, called a desert king snake. This is a full species. It's not a subspecies. And they're really cool looking snakes. They look a lot like a mixture of a speckled king snake and an eastern, an eastern king snake like we have here in Maryland. Uh, breeding king snakes. King snakes will need uh, to be put into brumation or formerly known as hibernation for two or three months a year in order to stimulate them to breed. They won't breed on their own. You kind of have to simulate a winter for them. And I put mine down in temperatures between about 40 and 55 degrees um, between probably late December, early March, depending on the snake. And um, I have a garage that's perfect for it. You, you really don't want to put them down to temperatures close to freezing because it's just it's not going to kill them, but it's not really necessarily good for them. So you want to just get them cold for a few months a year, and um, and then they breed as soon as they, you bring them out. You start feeding them again in the spring. They'll breed. Um, care must be taken to ensure the the pair of king snakes doesn't eat each other. I I have heard horror stories where. People have put a male and a female together and come back and one of them's missing because it ate the other one. And they will, they are cannibalistic and they will eat, they will eat even their own species. But if they're about the same size and they're well fed when you put them together, they'll probably be okay. Um, but you should, you, you gotta keep that into consideration because it happens. I've heard it, it I've heard it happens. Um, Gravid king snakes, female king snakes, they eat like crazy when they have eggs. Um, and so far, the ones, the females I've had, I just, I just feed them. I just let them eat whatever they'll take. And uh, they need a lot of calcium to make those eggs. So they eat a lot. The eggs are laid in midsummer or, and usually hatch in late summer or early fall. Um, it's not real hard to incubate them. You can keep them on on a bed of moss or vermiculite. I used vermiculite this last year. Keep them warm, make sure they don't dry out, and most of the time they'll hatch. Um, and hatchlings, you can sell them on the commercial pet. You can sell them on a commercial pet market because sometimes you can have as many as ten or twelve or fifteen babies when when the eggs hatch. Uh, here's a couple of photos I took in Texas of these. This is the three different color schemes of gray banded king snakes you can find in Texas. And those guys out there, this, this is the crown jewel of all the herpers that I ever met in Texas. This is what they're looking for. They're looking for these guys because I think they breed them and then they can sell the, the hatchlings the, can get a really high price. Yeah, and they're they're really pretty snakes. I, I do admit, I'd love to find one. I haven't found one yet out there, but they, you don't typically find them on the roads at night, like like a lot of other snakes. So it can be a challenge, and maybe that's why they like them. They're 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 hard to find. Okay, Maryland laws and permits regarding king snakes. You do need to have a permit from the state of Maryland to keep more than four specimens and or to breed native Maryland species, regardless of what 
their color variant is. So if it's an Eastern King snake like we have here and you're breeding them or you have more than four, um, you basically have to have a permit. Um, the permit's only like $10 a year and Maryland DNR wants to see a list of the snakes you have. Uh, there's a lot of people that have a lot of feelings over this kind of stuff. Um, I kind of look at it. I do kind of think it's a bit much to, you know, you can keep a dog or a cat and you don't need to pay the state to have them. But for whatever reason, this is the, the current law. I'm not saying I necessarily agree with it. Um, but you can have boas and pythons and any species not native to Maryland and you don't have to have a permit. And you can breed them and pretty much do whatever you want, as far as I can tell. But like, I'm not a lawyer, so, and, and some of these laws are kind of confusing. And I did look recently for this presentation and they, the DNR, Maryland DNR, here's the link. So if you got questions, you can go look. They, they did update their website recently and it's a little more clear for me than what it used to be. Um, but we have like, basically in Maryland, we have lists. We have a list A, list B, and a list C of animals you can keep and the different restrictions for each. Uh, if an animal is endangered, you can't keep them at all, I don't think. Uh, and like the bottom bullet, you can't keep a venomous snake in Maryland without a permit. I, I actually don't know how hard it would be to get a permit. Um, I haven't tried because I don't really have any interest in keeping a venomous snake right now. Another thing it is, it is illegal to kill a wild snake in Maryland. Um, I don't know how they got that through the legislature, but they got it through. I don't know how it's enforced. I can't find any uh, examples of it being enforced online, but maybe, maybe they are, but it's kind of cool that our state says you can't kill snakes. Uh, I'm all for that. Uh, and this is, um, um, Greer's or Durango king snake that you can only find in Mexico, even though this um, presentation was named King Snakes of the U.S. This was such a cool looking snake. I wanted to include it. It's um, one of our friends, Katrina's snake. She keeps, she's keeps she got a couple of them. And I just thought it was a real cool looking snake. Wanted to drop it in there. It looks a lot like the um, gray banded king snakes from the previous not slides, they're kind of orange and gray and black. And then so for a little humor, I stuck a cartoon in here, Medusa's baby picture. <laughs> and I think that's it. Oh yeah, and this is the king snake, my male from the first slide. This is him when I first got him. He was a tiny little thing and he's almost, uh, three and a half feet now and it's been a little over two years it's been about two and a half years and he was you know tiny little thing that fit in my hand and he's now like uh, really getting really big really big snake well three and a half feet is big for me so that's it that's my okay. presentation and uh if anybody has any Russ, questions or comments Oh. Yeah, can we un can you unshare and we can come back together and we can do questions and answers? Sure. Uh, how do I oh, stop share? There we go. Yeah, okay. let me put a, um, spotlight on you. Wow, they were just gorgeous. It was like looking at eye candy, and it, but it was it was they so gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. Um, thank you. And I learned that. Uh, when I'm going to be menu planning, uh, if I want more protein and less fat, I'm going to go with rats rather than snakes. <laughs> so that was my takeaway. Yeah, that's, that's um, true. <laughs> do we have any questions for Russ? You can raise your hand, um, or you can put it in the chat box. Or if you raise your hand, I can call on you, and you can unmute and talk to um, talk to Russ. I'm just trying to catch up and read the comments here. Yes, thank you. 
They are. They are really pretty snakes. Yeah, and it's uh, since I keep different species, I gotta wash my hands. If I pick up my king snake, even if it doesn't musk me, and most of them don't anymore, and they're used to being handled, the other snakes can smell them, and the other snakes get upset because it's a predator of theirs. So I kind of had to figure that out on my own. But it works a lot better, especially when you're photographing them, and I put them on the same same place in the house on a window ledge here when I photograph them. And if they smell king snake, they won't. They're just they're scared to death. Do can can you does it have does the musk have a smell that we can smell? You, you kind of can. Every snake, and you can talk to different herpers, but most of us will say the worst musk is water snakes are really stinky. Garter snakes can be really stinky. King snakes, rat snakes, I don't think it's a bad smell for me, but the other snakes know what it is and they know they're in danger or they think they're in danger when they smell it because king snakes, them. they absolutely kill rattlesnakes and, and copperheads or whatever. They, they don't care. They're, they're they're apex predators. They really are. And they're gorgeous. And, we, they're, and they make great pets. So so when you've been herping in, in and around Maryland, have you found any? You said that you've seen one, but not uh, uh, a lot of the king snakes? I have been looking. Well, yeah, I have not found a king snake in Maryland. We have them. They're getting harder and harder to find, according to what I've heard. And you can only find them down in mostly in southern Maryland. Yeah, king snakes, it's only southern Maryland now, down near St. Mary's County, Charles County. Um, I had an email exchange with Scott Smith, who's our state herpetologist at DNR, and he, he, he lives down there and he says, I only find like one a year. And he knows where they go, you know, he knows where to go, he knows where they are. And he says, yeah, I think they're in trouble. They're, we don't know why. But they're also nocturnal snakes. You can't find them during the day. And I do a lot of day herping. So there's certain species that you're just not going to see during the day. And, and road cruising in Southern Maryland is a bit iffy because there's so much traffic. No matter where you go in Maryland, we have traffic everywhere. So then you go to West Texas out in the middle of the desert and there's no cars out there. So the, you can find snakes on the road. Here it's a lot harder at night. I haven't done it yet. It's, it's, it's tough. But I haven't found a corn snake here either. And we, we do have them. Um, but I just went, I just came back from Florida in December, like early January. And I, I didn't see any live corn snakes, but I saw a couple of dead ones on the road. When I was just down there. So it's easier to find them in other states. Maryland, there's certain species that we have, but we're worried about them because the habitat loss, you know, people killing them, people moving them, whatever, pesticides, lack of lack of prey, whatever the reasons are. Scott thinks the king snakes in Maryland are going on the down, on the downward. But um, we do have them. They're here. And um, when you're when you're in Texas, do they, are they attracted to the road because of the heat? Yeah. Yeah. Snakes will get on the roads at night because, and it's really strange in Texas. It's I was there in July two years ago. It's literally a hundred, a hundred degrees plus during the day. So the snakes can't come out during the day. A lot of the other species that are not nocturnal, they can't move around or do a whole lot during the day. It's just too hot for them. But then at night, they all, it's so hot, but they'll still crawl out on the roads. Like the rattlesnakes love the heat. They, they're certain, certain species, rattlesnakes love heat. And it, it could be 100 degrees and they're still crawling out on the roads out there. Here, you know, we have temps from whatever, 60 or 50 at night in the summer to 80, 90 during the day. And, but yeah, snakes are attracted to the, the night snakes are attracted to the roads at night. And then of course, a lot of them get hit. Even in Texas, a lot of them get hit. They just have fewer cars and more, more miles, if you will. 
Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions for Russ this evening? If not, we want to remind you that Joe, Joe has some aquarium and some rat cages, mice cages, sorry, mice cages that he is trying to divest himself of and it would make his wife very happy. So if you are in Baltimore area uh, and want uh, some aquariums or mice cages, um, you can talk to Joe, put it in the chat box and y'all can exchange uh, contact information. Um, as a reminder, in the chat box is the link to the Vernal Pools. If you are a Herp Club member, uh, I uh, encourage you to sign up for one or of the two um, uh, special Vernal Club, uh, Vernal Pool field trips that are coming up. Uh, remember, it's limited because of the specialized um, habitat that we're going into to only 10. So make sure that you snag your spot while you can. Uh, and if you are interested in getting involved with um, World Turtle Day, uh, bringing snakes for our Founders Day, celebrating uh, George Kelly, and what was the other one? The Merit Badge, um, you know, Bio Blitz, and if you want to be a, a field herper mentor, let us know. Here is my email. And there is a snake. There she is. Yep. Whoops. Yeah. She's still little, but.